Hello, and welcome to another, I guess, soft-spoken ASMR video. Anyway, I tried to make this video well in French. It didn't turn out. So we're going to do it in English. Now, I'm not saying that this series is a literature masterpiece, because it's not, and it's got its problems. But, it's my comfort food. So it's gonna be your comfort food today. We're gonna read chapter one together. Preface. I'd never given much thought to how I would die, though I'd had reason enough in the last few months. But if I ever had, I would not have imagined it like this. I stared without breathing across the long room into the dark eyes of the hunter, and he looked pleasantly back at me. Surely it was a good way to die, in the place of somebody else, someone that I loved. N noble, even. That ought to count for something. I knew that if I'd never gone to Forks, I wouldn't be facing death right now. But, terrified as I was, I couldn't bring myself to regret this decision. When life offers you a dream so far beyond any of your expectations, it's not reasonable to grieve when it comes to an end. The hunter smiled in a friendly way as he sauntered toward to kill me. Chapter 1 First Sight my mother drove me to the airport with the windows rolled down. It was 75 degrees in Phoenix, the sky a perfect cloudless blue. I'm wearing my favorite shirt, sleeveless white eyelet lace. I was wearing it as a farewell gesture. My carry-on item was a parka. In the Olympic Peninsula of the Northwest, Washington State. A small town named Forks exists under a near constant cover of clouds. It rains on this inconsequential town more than any other place in the United States of America. It was from this town and its gloomy, omnipresent shade that my mother escaped with me when I was only a few months old. It was this town I'd been compelled to spend a month every summer until I was 14. That was the year I finally put my foot down. These past three summers, my dad, Charlie, vacationed with me in California for two weeks instead. It was to Forks that I now exiled myself, an action that I took with great horror. I detested Forks. I loved Phoenix. I loved the sun and the blistering heat. I loved the vigorous, sprawling city. Bella, my mom said to me the last of a thousand times before I get on the plane. You don't have to do this. My mother looked at me, or my mother looks like me, except with short hair and laugh lines. I felt a spasm of panic as I started, or as I stared at her wild, eyed like child, childlike eyes. <laughs> However, I, no, how could I leave my loving, erratic, hair-brained mother to fend for herself? Of course, she had Phil now, so the bills would probably get paid. But there would, <laughs> there would be food in the refrigerator, ga gas in her car, and someone to call when she got lost. But still, I want to go, I lied. I ha I'd always been a bad liar, but saying this lie so frequently in the last... I I'd been saying this lie so frequently lately that it all sounded almost convincing. Tell Charlie I said hi. I will. I'll see you soon. You can come home whenever you want. I'll be right back as soon as you need me. But I could see the sacrifice in her eyes between the prom behind the promise. Don't worry about me. It'll be great. I love you, Mom. She hugged me tightly for a minute and I got on the plane. She was gone. It was a four hour flight from Phoenix to Seattle, another hour in a small plane up to Port Angeles, and then an hour drive back down to Forks. Flying doesn't bother me. The hour in the car with Charlie, though, is a bit worried about that. Charlie had er, Charlie had really been fairly nice about the whole thing. He seemed genuinely pleased that I was coming to live with him for the first time with any degree of permanence. He had already gotten me registered for the high school and was going to help me get a car. But it was sure to be awkward with Charlie. Neither of us were really verbose. I didn't know. 
I didn't know what there was to say regardless. I knew he was more than a little confused by my decision. He, like my mother before me, wait, no, <laughs> like my mother before me, I hadn't made a secret of my distaste for forks. When I landed in Port Angeles, it was raining. I didn't see it as an omen, just unavoidable. I had already said my goodbyes to the sun. Charlie was waiting for me with the cruiser. Yes, I was expecting to. Charlie is the police chief. To the good people of Forks. My primary motivation behind buying a car, despite the scarcity of my funds, was that I refused to be driven around a car with, or yeah, driven around town in a car with red and blue lights on top. Nothing slows down traffic like a cop. <laughs> Charlie gave me an awkward one-harmed hug when I stumbled up my way off the plane. It's good to see you, Bells, he said, smiling as he automatically caught and steadied me. You haven't changed much. How's Renee? Mom's fine. It's good to see you too, Dad. I wasn't allowed to call him Charlie to his face. I'd only had a few bags. Most of my Arizona clothes were too permeable for Washington. My mother and I pulled our resources to supplement my winter wardrobe, but it was still scanty. It all fit easily into the trunk of the cruiser. I found a good car for you. Really cheap. <laughs> what kind of car? I was suspicious to the way that he said car for you, not just car. Well, it's a truck, actually. A Chevy. Where did you find it? Do you remember Billy Black down at the Push? The Push is a tiny Indian reserve on the coast. No. He promised to go fish, or he used to go fish, <laughs> fishing with us during the summer, Charlie prompted. That would explain why I don't remember him. I do a really good job of blocking out painful, unnecessary things from my memory. He's in a wheelchair now, so he can't drive anymore, and he offered to sell me his truck really cheap. What year is it? I could see from his change of expression that this was the question he was hoping I wouldn't ask. Well, Billy's done a lot of work on the engine. It's only a few years old, really. I hope he didn't think of so little of me to believe I would take and give up that easily. When did he buy it? He bought it in 1984, I think. <laughs> did he buy it new? Well, no. I think it was new in the early 60s. Or late 50s at the earliest. J <laughs> Dad, I don't really know anything about cars. I wouldn't be able to fix it if anything went wrong. I can't really afford a mechanic. Really, Bella, the thing runs great. They don't build them like that anymore. <laughs> the thing, I thought to myself. It had possibilities, as a nickname, at least. How cheap is cheap? After all, that's the part I couldn't compromise on. Well, honey, I kind of already bought it for you as a homecoming gift. Charlie being sideways at me with a hopeful expression. Wow, free. You didn't have to do that, Dad. I was going to buy a car myself. I don't mind. I want you to be happy here. He was looking ahead at the road when he said this. Charlie wasn't comfortable with expressing his emotions out loud. I inherited that from him, so I was looking... I was looking straight ahead as I responded. That's really nice, Dad. Thanks. I really appreciate it. No need to add that me being happy in Forks is an impossibility. He didn't need to suffer along with me, and I never looked a free truck in the mouth or an engine. Well, now, <laughs> you're welcome. We exchanged a few more comments on the weather, which was wet, and that was pretty much the conversation. He stared out the windows in silence. It was beautiful, of course. I couldn't deny that. Everything was green. The trees, their trunks covered with moss, their branches hanging with a canopy of it. The ground was covered in ferns. Even the air filtered down greenly through the leaves. It was too green. An alien planet. Eventually, we made it to Charlie's. He still lived in the small two-bedroom house that we had bought, or he had bought with my mother in the early days of their marriage. Those were the only kind of days that their marriage had. The early ones. There, parked on the street in front of the house that never changed was my new, well, new to me, truck. 
It was a faded red color with big rounded fenders and a bulbous cab. To my surprise, I loved it. I didn't know if it would run, but I could see myself in it. Plus, it was one of the solid iron affairs that never gets damaged. The kind you would see on the scene of an accident. Paint unscratched, surrounded by the pieces of a foreign car it had destroyed. Wow, Dad, I love it. Thanks. Now my horrific day tomorrow would be just that much less dreadful. I wouldn't be faced with the choice of either walking two miles in the rain to school or accepting a ride from Charlie in the cruiser. I'm glad you like it, Charlie gr said gruffly and parents to him. It only took one trip to get all of my stuff upstairs. I got the west bedroom that faced over the front yard and the room was familiar. It had belonged to me since I was born. The wooden floor, the light blue walls, the peaked ceiling, the yellow lace curtains around the window, these were all a part of my childhood. The only thing that Charlie had ever, the only changes Charlie had ever made were switching out the crib for a bed and adding a desk as I grew. The desk now held a second-hand computer with the phone line for the modem stapled along the floor to the nearest phone jack. This was the stipulation for my mother so that we could stay in touch easily. The rocking chair from my baby days was still in the corner. There was only one small bathroom at the top of the stairs, which I would have to share with Charlie. I was trying not to dwell on that fact too much. One of the things about Charlie is that he doesn't hover. He left me alone to unpack and get settled, a feat that would have been altogether impossible for my mother. It was nice to be alone, not to not to have to smile and look pleased, a relief to stare dejectedly out the window at the sheeting rain and just let a few tears escape. I wasn't in the mood on I wasn't on the mood to go on a real crying drag. I would have to save that for bedtime. <laughs> when I would have to think about the coming morning. What the hell? Forks High School had a frightening total of only 357, now 58, students. There were more than 700 people in my junior class alone back home. All of the kids had grown up together. Their parents had been toddlers together. I would be the new girl from a big city, a curiosity, a freak. Maybe if I looked like a girl from Phoenix should, I could work this to my advantage, but physically I'd never fit anywhere. I should be tall, tan, sporty, blonde, a volleyball player, or a cheerleader perhaps. All the things that would go with living in the Valley of the Sun, but instead I was ivory skinned without even an excuse of blue hairs or red or <laughs> blue eyes or red hair. Despite the constant sunshine, I had always been slender. That didn't make sense. <laughs> I had always been slender, but soft somehow. Only obviously not an athlete. I didn't have a nece uh, the necessary hand-eye coordination to play sports without humiliating myself and harming both myself and everyone who stood too close. When I finished putting my clothes into the old pine dresser, I took my bag of bathroom necessities and went to the communal bathroom to clean myself up after the day of travel. I looked at my face in the mirror as I brushed through my tangled hair. Maybe it was the light, but I already looked shallower, unhealthy. My skin could be pretty. It was very clear, almost translucent looking, but it all depended on color. I had no color here. <laughs> Facing my pallid reflection in the mirror, I was forced to admit that I wasn't, that I was lying to myself. It wasn't just physically that I'd never fit in. And if people, and if I couldn't find an issue in a school with 3,000 people, what were my chances here? I didn't relate well to people my age. Maybe the truth was that I don't relate relate well to people, period. Even my mother, who I was closer to than anyone else, was never really in harmony with me. Never exactly on the same page. 
sometimes I wondered if I was seeing things through my eye, or if I was seeing the same thing through my eyes that the rest of the world was seeing through theirs. Maybe there was a glitch in my brain, but the cause didn't matter. All that mattered was the effect, and tomorrow would be just the beginning. Um, I don't remember how long this chapter is. But there's a space here. It's applying a break. Okay, we don't have too much more. We're like halfway through. I didn't sleep well that night, even after I was done crying. The constant whooshing of the rain and wind across the roof didn't fade into the background. I pulled the faded old quilt over my head and later added the pillow too, but I couldn't fall asleep until after midnight when the rain finally settled to a quieter drizzle. Thick fog was all I could see out my window in this morning, and I could feel the claustrophobia creeping up on me. You could never see the sky here. It was like a cage. Breakfast with Charlie was a quiet event. He wished me good luck at school, I thanked him, knowing his hope was wasted. Good luck tended to avoid me. Charlie left first off. Oh, off to the police station. That was his wife and family. After he left, I sat at the old square oak table in one of those one of the three unmatching chairs and examined the small kitchen with its dark panels, bright yellow cabinets, and white linoleum floor. Nothing changed. My mother had painted the cabinets 18 years ago in an attempt to bring some sunshine into the house. Over the small fireplace in the adjoining handkerchief-sized family room was a row of pictures. First, a wedding picture of Charlie and my mom in Las Vegas. Then one of the three of us in the hospital after a year I was born, taken by a helpful nurse, followed the procession of school pictures up to last year's. Those were embarrassing to look at. I would have to see it. <laughs> what I could get, what I could do to get Charlie to put them somewhere else, at least while he was living here. It was impossible, being in this house, not to realize that Charlie had not gotten over my mom. It made me uncomfortable. <laughs> I didn't want to be too early to school, but I couldn't stay in the house anymore. I donned my jacket, which had the feel of a biohazard suit, and headed out into the rain. It was still drizzling, not enough to soak me through immediately as I reached for the house key that was always hidden under the eaves by the door and locked up. The sloshing of my new waterproof boots was unnerving. I missed the normal crunch of gravel as I walked. I couldn't pause or yeah, I couldn't pause and admire my truck again as I wanted. I was in a hurry to get out of the misty wet that smote around my head and clung to my hair. Inside the truck, it was nice and dry. Either Billy or Charlie had obviously cleaned up, but the tan upholstered seats still smelled faintly of tobacco, gasoline, and peppermint. The engine started quickly, to my relief, but the loud roaring to life and then idling to a top volume. Well, the truck was old and bound to have a flaw. The antique radio worked, a plus that I hadn't expected. Finding the school wasn't difficult, though I'd never been there before. The school was, like most other things, just off the highway. It was not obvious that it was a school. Only the sign, which declared Forex High School, made me stop. It looked like a collection of matching houses, built with maroon-colored bricks. There were so many trees and shrubs that I couldn't see its size at first. Where was the feel of the institution, I wondered nostalgically. Where were the chain link fa fences and metal detectors? <laughs> I parked in front of the first building, which had a small sign over the door reading front office. 
No one else parked there, so I'm sure it was off limits, but I decided I would go in and get directions instead of circling around in the rain like an idiot. I stepped unwillingly out of the toasty truck cab and walked down a little porch, a stone path lined with dark hedges. I took a deep breath before opening the door. Inside, it was brightly lit and warmer than I'd hoped. The office was small, a little waiting area with padded folding chairs, orange flecked commercial carpet, notices and awards cluttering the walls, a big clock ticking loudly. Plants grew everywhere in plastic pots, as if there wasn't enough greenery outside. The room was cut in half by a long counter cluttered with wired baskets full of papers and brightly colored flyers taped to its front. There was three desks behind the counter, one of which was manned by a large red-haired woman wearing glasses. She was wearing a purple t-shirt, which immediately made me feel overdressed. The red-haired woman looked up to you. Can, or looked up, can I help you? I'm Isabella Swan, I informed her, and saw immediate awareness in her eyes. I was expected. A topic of gossip, no doubt. The daughter of the chief's flighty ex-wife come home at last. Of course. She dug through a <laughs> or precariously stacked pile of documents on her desk, and she found the one she was looking for. I have your schedule right here. A map of the school. She brought several sheets to the counter to show me. She went through my glasses for me, highlighting the best route on each map, and gave me a slip to, or to have each teacher sign, which I was going to bring at the back at the, en or back at the end of the day. She smiled to me and hoped, like Charlie, that I would have it, or that I would like it here in Forks. I smiled as I convincingly could. When I went back to my truck, other students were starting to arrive. I drove around the school, following the line of traffic. I was glad to see that most of the cars were, or, were older, like mine. Nothing flashy. At home, I'd lived in one of the few low in, lower income neighborhoods that were included in Paradise Valley District. It was common to see a new Mercedes or Porsche in the student lot. The nicest car here was a shiny Volvo, and it stood out. Still, I cut the engine as soon as I was in a spot so that the thunder's volume didn't draw any attention to me. I looked at the map in the truck, trying to memorize it now. Hopefully I wouldn't have to walk around with it stuck in front of my nose all day. I stuffed everything in my bag, slung the strap over my shoulder, and sucked in a huge breath. I can do this, I lied to myself feebly. No one was going to bite me. I finally exhaled and stepped out of the truck. I kept my face from pulling, or no, I kept my face pulled back into my hood as I walked to the sidewalk, crowded with teenagers. My plain, my plain black jacket didn't stand out. I had noticed with relief. Once I gotten around the cafeteria, building three was easy to spot. A large black three painted on a white square on the east corner. I felt my breathing gradually creeping toward hyperventilation as I approached the door. I tried to holding my breath as I followed two unisex raincoats towards the door. The classroom was small. People in front of me stopped just inside the door to hang up their coats on a long row of hooks. I copied them. There were two there were two girls, one with her porcelain colored blonde and the other pale with light brown hair. At least my skin wouldn't stand out here. I took a slip of paper up to the teacher, a tall, balding man whose desk nameplate identified him as Mr. Mason. He gawked at me when he saw my name. Not an encouraging response. And of course, I flushed tomato red. But at least he sent me to an empty desk at the back without introducing me to the class. It was harder for my classmates to stare at me in the back, but somehow they managed. I kept my eyes down on the read or yeah, down on the reading list that the teacher had given me. It was fairly basic. Bronte, Shakespeare, Faulkner. 
I'd read everything. That was comforting and boring. I wondered if my mom would send me my folder of old essays, or if she'd think that was cheating. I went through different arguments with her in my head while the teacher droned on. The bell rang, a nasal buzzing sound, a gangly boy with skin problems and black, no, black hair, no, hair black as an oil slick, leaned across the aisle to talk to me. You're Isabella Swan, aren't you? You look like the overly chest club type. Bella, I located, or I corrected. God, and wait. Everyone at the uh, 3C radius turned around to look at me. What's your next class? Um, government with Jefferson in building six. There was nowhere to look without meeting curious eyes. I'm heading towards building four. I could show you the way. Definitely over helpful. I'm Eric, he added. I smiled tentatively. Thanks. We got our jackets and headed out to the rain, which had picked up. I could have sworn several people behind us were talking or walking close enough to eavesdrop. I hope I wasn't getting paranoid. So this is a lot different than Phoenix, huh? Very. It doesn't rain very much there, does it? Three or four times a year. Wow, what's that must be like? He wondered. Sunny. <laughs> you don't look very tan. Well, my mother is part albino. He studied my face apprehensively, and I sighed. It looks like the clouds and a sense of the humor didn't mix. A few months of this, and I'd forget how to use sarcasm. We walked back around the cafeteria to the south buildings by the gym. Eric walked me right to the door, though it was very clearly marked. Well, good luck, he said as I touched the handle. Maybe we'll have some other classes together. He sounded hopeful. I smiled at him vaguely and went inside. The rest of the morning passed in the same fashion. The trig teacher, Mr. Varner, who I would have hated anyway just because of the subject he taught, was the only one who made me stand in front of the class and introduce myself. I stammered, blushed, and tripped over my own boots. After two classes, I started to recognize several of the faces in each class. There was always somebody braver than the others who would introduce themselves and ask me questions and how I was liking Borgs. I tried to be diplomatic, but mostly I just lied a lot. At least I never needed the map. One girl who sat next to both or next to me both in Trig and Spanish, and she walked with me to the cafeteria for lunch. She was tiny, several inches shorter than my five foot four. But her wildly curly hair made up a lot of the difference in her heights. I couldn't remember her name, so I smiled, or I smiled and nodded as she prattled about the teachers and classes. I didn't try to keep up. We sat at the end, or yeah, we sat at the end of a full table with several of her friends, who she introduced me to. I forgot all of their names as soon as he spoke them. They seemed impressed by her bravery in speaking to me. The boy from English, Eric, waved at me from across the room. He was there, sitting in the lunchroom, trying to make a new conversation with several curious uh, strangers that I first saw them. They were sitting in the corner of the cafeteria, as far away from where I sat as possible in the long room. There were five of them. They weren't talking, and they weren't eating though they had a tray of untouched food in front of them. They weren't even gawking at me, unlike most other students, so it was safe to stare at them without fear of meeting an excessively interested pair of eyes. But it was none of these things that caught and held my attention. They didn't look anything alike. Of the three boys, one was big, muscled like a serious weightlifter, with dark curly hair. Another, taller, leaner, but still muscular, and honey blonde. The last was lanky, less bulky, with an untidy bronze hair color. He was more boyish than the others, who looked like they could be in college or even teachers rather than students. The girls were opposites. One was tall, or the tall one was statuesque. She had a beautiful figure, the kind you would see on the cover of Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition, the kind that made every girl around her 
take a hit on her self-esteem just by being in the same room. Her hair was golden, gently waving in the middle of her back. The short girl was pixie-like, a thin and extreme, with small features. Her hair was deep black and cropped short, pointing in every direction. And yet, they were all exactly alike. Every one of them was chalky pale, the palest of all the students living in this sunless town. Paler than me, the albino. They had all very dark eyes, despite the range in their tones. They also had dark shadows under the eyes, purplish, bruise-like shadows, If they were all, as if they were all suffering from a sleepless night, or almost done recovering from a broken nose. Though their noses, all their features, were straight, perfect, angular. But all this is not why I couldn't look away. I stared because their faces, so different, so similar, were all devastatingly, inhumanly beautiful. Their faces you'd... They were faces you'd never expect to see, except... Perhaps on the airbrushed pages of a fashion magazine painted by an old master as the face of an angel. It was hard to decide who was the most beautiful. Maybe the perfect blonde girl or the bronze-haired boy. They were all looking away, away from each other, away from the other students, away from anything in particular as far as I could tell. As I watched, the small girl froze, fro no, froze with her tray, a open soda and bitten apple and walked away with a quick, graceful lope that belonged on a runway. I watched, amazed, as her, her lithe dancer's step, till she jumped the tray and glided through the back door, faster than I could, faster than I would have thought possible. My eyes darted back to the others. Who are they? I asked the girl from my Spanish class, whose name I'd forgotten. As she looked to see what I meant, already knowing, probably, from my tone. S suddenly, he looked at her, the thinner one, the boyish one, the youngest, perhaps. He looked at my neighbor for just a fraction of a second, and then his dark eyes flickered to mine. He looked away quickly, more quickly than I could. Though, in a flush of embarrassment, I dropped my eyes at once. In that brief flash of a glance, he held nothing of interest. It was as if she had called his name, and he looked up in involuntary response, already having decided not to answer. My neighbor giggled in embarrassment, looking at the table like I did. That's Edward and Emmett Collin, and Rosalie and Jasper Hale. The one that just left was Alice Collin. They all lived together with Dr. Collin and his wife, she said under her breath. I glanced sideways at the beautiful boy. He was looking at his tray now, picking a bagel to pieces with long, pale fingers. His mouth was moving very quickly, his perfect lips barely opening. The other three still looked away, yet I felt he was speaking quietly to them. Strange, unpopular names, I had thought. The kind of names that grandparents would have. Then maybe that was just in vogue in small towns. Finally, I'd remembered the name, or that my neighbor was called Jessica, a perfectly common name. There were two small girls, or there were two girls named Jessica in my history class back home. They're very nice looking. I shrugged with a, conspic or a conspicuous understatement. Yes, Jessica agreed with another giggle. They're all together, though. Emmett and Rosalie, Jasper and Alice. I mean, and they lived together. Her voice held a shock and condemnation. A small town. I thought critically, but if I'm being honest, I had to admit even in Phoenix this would cause gossip. Which ones are the Collins? They don't look related. Oh, they're not. Dr. Cullen is young, in his 20s or early 30s. They're all adopted. The Hills are brother and sister, twins, the blonde, and they're foster children. They look a little old to be foster children. They are now. Jasper and Rosalie are both 18, but they've been with Mrs. Gollin since they were eight. 
she's their aunt or something like that. That's really kind of nice for them to take care of all those children like that. When they're young and everything. I guess so. She admitted reluctantly. And I got the impression that she didn't like the doctor and his wife for some reason. With the glances. With the glances she was throwing at their adopted children, I presume the reason was jealousy. I think it. I think that Miss. Yeah, Mrs. Collins can't have any kids, though. She added it as if that lessened their kindness. Throughout all this conversation, my eyes flickered again and again to the table where the strange family sat. They continued. They continued to look at the walls and not eat. Have they always lived in Forks? I asked. Surely I would have noticed them on one of my summers here. No, they just moved down from Alaska two years ago. I felt a surge of pity, and really pity because as beautiful as they were, they were outsiders. Clearly not accepted. Relief that I wasn't the only newcomer here, and certainly not the most interesting by that standard. As I exclaimed, the youngest of the Collins, or as I examined them, the youngest of the Collins, looked up and met my glaze, this time with evident curiosity in his expression. As I looked swiftly away, it seemed to me that his glance held some kind of unmet expectation. Which one is the boy with the reddish brown hair? I asked. I peeked at him from the corner of my eye, and he was still staring at me, but not gawking like the other students had today. He had a slightly frustrated expression. <laughs> I looked down again. That's Edward. He's gorgeous, of course. But don't waste your time. He doesn't date. Apparently none of the girls here are good looking enough for him. She sniffed. A clear case of the sour grapes. I wondered... I wondered when he turned her down. I bit my lip to hide my smile. I... I then glanced at him again. His face was turned away, though I thought his cheek appeared lifted as if he was smiling too. After a few more minutes, the four, the four of them left the table together. They were all noticeably graceful, even the big brawny one. It was unsettling to watch. The one named Edward didn't even or didn't look at me again. I sat at the table with Jessica and her friends longer than I would have if I had been sitting alone. I was anxious to not be late for the class or class on my first day. One of my new acquaintances, who considerably reminded me that her name was Angela, had biology too with me the next hour. We walked together to class in silence. She was shy too. When we had entered the room, Angela went to sit at a black top table, exactly like the ones I was used to. She already had a neighbor. In fact, all the neighbors or all of the tables were full, except one. Next to the center aisle, I recognized Edward Cullen by his unusual hair, sitting next to a single open seat. As I walked down the aisle to introduce myself to the teacher and get my slip filled, I was watching him superstitiously. Just as I'd passed, he suddenly went rigid in his seat. He stared at me again, meeting my eyes with the strangest expression on his face. It was hostile, furious. I looked away, shocked, going red again. I stumbled over a book in the hallway, or in the walkway. I tried to catch myself on the edge of the table. The girl was sitting there giggled. I noticed his eyes were black, coal black. Mr. Banner sighed, or signed my slip and handed me a book with no nonsense about introductions. I could tell we were going to get along. Of course, he had no choice to send me but to the one open seat in the middle of the room. I kept my eyes down as I went to sit by him, bewildered by the antagonistic stare he had given me. I didn't look up as I set my book on the table and took my seat, but I saw his posture change from the corner of my eye. He was leaning away from me, sitting on the extreme edge of his chair and averting his face like he had smelled something bad. Inconspicuously, I sniffed my hair. It smelled like strawberries, the scent of my favorite shampoo. It seemed an innocent enough odor. I let my hair fall over my right shoulder, making a dark curtain between us. 
and tried to pay attention to the teacher. Unfortunately, the lecture was on cellular anatomy, something I'd already studied. I took notes carefully anyway, always looking down. I couldn't stop myself from peeking occasionally, though, uh, through the screen of my hair at the strange boy next to me. During the whole class, he never relaxed his stiff position on the edge of his chair, sitting as far from me as possible. I could see his hand on his left leg clenched into a fist, tendons were st tending standing out of under his pale skin. This too, he never relaxed. He had long sleeves on. The long sleeves of his white shirt pushed up to his elbows. His forearm, forearm was surprisingly hard and muscular beneath his white skin. He wasn't nearly as slight as I, as he had looked next to his burly brother. <sighs> Boy. The class seemed to drag on longer than the others would hope. Or than the others. Was it because the day was finally coming to a close, or because I was waiting for his tight fist to loosen? It never did. He continued to sit so still, it looked like he wasn't breathing. What was wrong with him? Was this his normal behavior? I questioned my judgment on Jessica's bitterness at lunch today. Maybe she was not so resentful as I thought. I couldn't have, or it couldn't have been anything to do with me. He didn't even know me from Eve. I peeked up at him one, one more time and regretted it. He was glaring down at me again with his black eyes full of revulsion as I flinched away from him, shrinking against my chair. The phrase, if looks could kill, suddenly ran through my mind. At that moment, the bell rang loudly, making me jump, <laughs> and Edward Cullen was out of his seat. Fluidly, he rose. He was much taller than I'd thought, his back to me, and he was out the door before anyone else was out of their seat. I sat frozen in my seat, staring blankly at him. He was so mean, it wasn't fair. I began gathering up my things slowly, trying to block out the anger that filled me, for my eyes would tear up. For some reason, my temper had been hardwired to my tear ducts. I usually cried when I was angry, a humiliating tendency. Aren't you Isabella Swan? A male voice asked. I looked up to see a cute, baby-faced boy. His pale blonde hair carefully gelled into orderly spikes, smiling at me in a friendly way. He obviously didn't think I smelled bad. Bella, I corrected him with a smile. I'm Mike. Hi, Mike. Do you need any help finding your next class? I'm heading to the gym, actually. I think I can find it. That's my next class, too. He seems thrilled. Though it wasn't that big of a coincidence in a school this small. He walked to cl or We walked to class together. He was a chatterer. He supplied most of the conversation, which was made it pretty easy for me. He lived in California till he was 10, so he knew how I felt about the sun. It turned out he was in my English class also. He was the nicest person I'd met today. But as we were entering the gym, he asked, So did you stab Edward Cullen with a pencil or what? <laughs> I'd never seen him act like that. I cringed. So I wasn't the only one that noticed. And apparently, that wasn't Edward Cullen's usual behavior. I decided to play dumb. Was that the boy I was sitting next to in biology? Yes. <laughs> he looked like he was in some... He was in pain or something. I don't know. I never spoke to him. He's a weird guy, Mike lingered by me instead of heading to the dressing room. If I were lucky enough to be sitting by you, I would have talked to you. I smiled at him before walking through the girls' locker room. He was friendly and clearly admiring, but it wasn't enough to erase my irritation. The gym teacher, Coach Clapp, found me a uniform but didn't make me dress down for today's class at home. Only two years of P.E. were required. Here, P.E. was mandatory for all four years. Forks was literally my personal hell on earth. I watched four volleyball games running simultaneously. Remembering how many injuries I sustained and inflicted playing volleyball, I felt faintly nauseated. The final bell rang at last. I walked slowly out of the office to return my paperwork. No, slightly to, slowly to the office to return my paperwork. The rain had drifted away. 
but the wind was strong and colder. I wrapped my arms around myself. When I walked into the warm office, I <laughs> turned around and walked back out. Edward Cullen stood at the desk in front of me, I recognized again by the tousled bronze hair. He didn't appear to notice the sound of my entrance. I stood pressed against the back wall, waiting for the re receptionist to be free. He was arguing with her in a low, attractive voice. I quickly picked up the gist of their argument. He was trying to trade sixth hour biology for any other time. I couldn't believe that this was just about me. It had to be something else, something that happened before I entered the biology room. The look on his face must have been about another aggravation entirely. It was impossible that this stranger could take such a sudden, intense dislike to me. The door opened again, and the cold wind suddenly gusted through the room, rustling the papers and swirling my hair around the face. The girl who came in merely stepped to the desk placed a note in the wire basket, and walked out again. But Edward Collins' back stiffened. He turned slowly to glare at me, his face absurdly handsome, with piercing, hate-filled eyes. For an instant, I felt a thrill of genuine fear, raising the hair from on my arms. The look only lasted for a second, but it chilled me more than the freezing wind. He turned back to the receptionist. Never mind, then. He said hastily, in a voice like velvet. I can see that it's impossible. Thank you so much for your help. He turned on his heel without another look at me and disappeared out the door. I went meekly to the desk, on my white face for once instead of red. On my face white for once instead of red, and handed her the signed slip. How did your first day go, dear? The receptionist asked maternally. Fine, I lied in a weak voice. She didn't look convinced. I got into, when I got into the truck, it was almost the last car in the lot. It seems like a haven, already the closest thing to home I had in this deep, or damp green hole. I sat inside for a while, just staring at the windshield blankly, but it, I soon was cold enough to need the heater, so I turned the key and the engine roared to life. I headed back to Charlie's place, fighting tears the whole way. And that's chapter one. Whoa. I didn't do too badly, I don't think. I could have done a lot worse. I like this book. It's, it's fun to read. It surprisingly good foreshadowing. No one's gonna bite me. Inhumanly beautiful. None of them look related. And then just reading Midnight Sun makes this book already better because you can see from Edward's point of view how he's frustrated because Bella smells amazing and that he can't read her mind and <laughs> him staring curiously at Bella because he can't read her mind and because he can hear Jessica talking about them Ugh. anyway expect a part two there's probably going to be a part two <laughs>